How are we doing? Legacy Church of Downing, we okay today? I know we got some June gloom in the sky, but I'm told that you people like that stuff. It's nice and cool outside. I'm from Bakersfield, so I'm dying inside a little bit. My body tells me it's supposed to be 150 degrees right now. Time to go to the beach. Which reminds me of a story. A long time ago, once upon a time, there was a younger Shane. And my family had just fallen apart. I had to leave home. And what I did was I ran away to my uncle's house, who was also my youth pastor. And in the middle of the night, I knocked on the door. Now that's what sane people would do. So I had been at his house earlier in the day. I left his window open so that I could break in if I needed to. And that's what I did. And I remember in this time of my life, everything was falling to the point that all we could do for about two weeks was just weep and cry. And you see stories of this in the Bible where people are so grieved that they actually tear their clothes. And it's like, I don't think that you need to add to grief by running around naked. So don't envision that or get any ideas. If you go running down the street naked, butt naked down Firestone, I'm going to have a different prayer for you before I come and help, okay? But that's what people would do in the Bible is they were so grieved, they would literally tear their clothes before God and they were just miserable. Fortunately, I didn't live back then, all right? This is back when I was 18. And with my uncle, what we did is he said, you know what? We're getting through this. We're going to Hawaii. It's like, man, all right. You know, if we got to have some hard times to go to Hawaii, I think that maybe Jesus bring the ring. You know what I'm saying? So... We went to Hawaii, Maui specifically, and while we're there, my uncle did tell that I was just really loving this place. I was resonating with it, and healing was taking place, and he told me, I didn't tell you yet, but I bought you a one-way plane ticket. Bought me a one-way plane ticket, and I said, Why? And he goes, because there's nothing for you at home. If you want to stay here, you can. And you know what? It was in that moment that I bought a lie that's really popular in our culture right now. And I wish this lie was true. I wish it was true. For all of you and for me, I wish this lie was true. But here's the lie. Faith grows through good and happy times. The lie is that faith grows through good and happy times. And let's not be superlative. Your faith can grow to some extent when things are okay. But that's not when it really grows. But I will say that this time in Maui that I had, it was an opportunity to connect with Jesus. He really centered me. And it was actually in Maui that I encountered God in such a way that it led me back home. This is what happened. So when you think of good and happy times, like literally what I envision is Lahaina before it burned down. Anybody ever been to Lahaina? Wow, Lahaina Town is just, well, it was just the most beautiful place on earth. Especially if you've been from Bakersfield like me. And it's like, it's a different kind of sand between Bakersfield and Lahaina and Hawaii. Absolutely gorgeous. And I remember... It was the day before my family was going home and I needed to make a decision on if I was going to stay in Maui or if I was going to go back to Bakersfield. <laughs> and we went out on the ocean on this snorkeling expedition and I was told that sometimes you see dolphins and I was just praying, oh Jesus, please let me see a dolphin. One of my favorite animals, by the way. I just think that they're so fantastic. And the tour guide told me, you're probably not going to see dolphins. They were here yesterday and they never come to the bay twice. I didn't believe them. I was praying. And as I was praying, all of a sudden a dolphin jumped out of the water and spun. And you could hear it. It was like, it's like, what was that? And I'd never heard of spinner dolphins before. I only knew of like the bottlenose dolphin, the basic one. It's like, it gets cooler than that? Are you serious? 
So then the captain goes, they're heading for the bay. Hurry up. Then dozens of dolphins, I can't tell you this picture, dozens are jumping by the boat. And we head for this bay and we pull in and the instructor gives some counsel and he says, get off the boat, go swim. And I jump in the water and I'm looking and just clear as, I was going to say clear as day, but we live in Los Angeles. So clear as an artificial picture of Los Angeles done by artificial intelligence to remove the smog. <laughs> Have you ever been snorkeling in Hawaii? There's nothing like it. You can just see all the way to the bottom. And we're in this bay and all around, just imagine this picture, hundreds of dolphins. Can you imagine just being there? Hundreds. It's like if you see one, you're lucky. You see hundreds, you've struck the lottery. It was called a super pod. You're swimming around this little cove in Lanai. And I asked the instructor, have you ever gotten to touch one? And he goes, you know what? After years of doing this, I finally figured out the secret yesterday. So I watched him and he was diving down way deep and flipping around and the dolphins were going around him and they were circling him. And I go, I have to touch a dolphin. So me being from Bakersfield, I can't hold my breath for very long. But I tried really hard. I dove down, nothing was happening. And I go, I'm doing this one more time. And if my lungs explode, so be it. So I go down and I'm flipping around, no action. I feel like I'm going to drown. And then I look to my left and right here was a dolphin. And I stuck out my hand and it let me touch it. And I got to follow it all the way to his tail. And I kid you not. This dolphin let me grab its tail and it took me back up to the surface. And in that moment, I knew that I had had a special encounter with the holy. Now, to whatever level that was a miracle or natural causes, it doesn't matter because I got to engage God's creation like I never had before and might not ever again. And as I was praying... And we were on this little boat heading back. I said, hey, uncle, God wants me to go home. I need you to buy me a plane ticket. Can you do that for me, please? And he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. What I always forget to tell in the story is that I had actually gotten a job and there was a studio apartment that I was going to stay in. It was like, it was set. It was set. And he said, what makes you want to go home? I said, because Jesus is calling me to be a pastor in California. I can't do that in Maui. Now, what I knew was before me was scary because if it's a lie that faith grows through good and happy times, I knew that there was an important lesson to be learned. And here's the truth is that faith grows through pain, suffering, sorrow, grieving, and lamenting. And in that moment, and going back home, I knew that this is what I was going to face. And to be honest with you, when I got back home, I really felt a lot of days like I made a mistake and needed to go back to Maui. Because for a lot of years, guess what? There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of suffering. There was a lot of sorrow. There was a lot of grieving. There was a lot of lamenting. Back in those years... There were things that I lost that can't be found again. And that's really why life is so difficult sometimes. Because when you go through something that's really hard, the reason why it's hard is it's because it's really like life is being ripped from you. It could be your family, it could be a relationship, your health, a job. Whatever's important to you, even if it seems small, if it hurts really bad when you're losing it, the reason why it hurts is because you're experiencing loss. And the Bible speaks to this. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like it. I do not like this. I don't know why this is in the Bible. I want it rewritten. I want it reevaluated. Because I've read it over and over and over again. This is what it says. Book of James. 
Count it all joy. I like that. When you meet trials of various kinds. I'm out. No. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. There's a lie in Christianity today that goes a little something like this. Follow Jesus and he'll make you healthy. Follow Jesus and he'll make you wealthy. Follow Jesus and everything's going to be okay all the time. And you know that that's a load of... Because... That was good. You like that censorship? Been working on that for you. You know it's not true because you look at Jesus' life. Last time I checked... He was crucified. I know that's not true because I look at the disciples. Last time I checked, all of them were murdered. Following Jesus makes it all okay? Really? Well, it does. But we have to get there and understand how it's okay from God's perspective and how that is different from our perspective. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds because the testing of your faith actually makes it stronger. But what does that really mean? Here's the truth. A hard time makes you sad, but a trial makes you question your faith. A hard time makes you sad. A bad day makes you sad. But you know you've entered a trial when literally your faith has gone to court and you're before the judge and you get to decide if you are going to put on evidence a faith that the judge looks at and says, this is legit. Or if you're going to throw up your hands and say, I'm out. Have any of you ever gone through a trial that was so difficult that it made you question your relationship with God? Thank you for being honest. Thank you. Just as a little interlude, I'm going to ask you to pray for my family right now. We're going through one of the hardest things we've ever gone through. And that's all the details that I'm going to share. Relationally, we're all going to be okay. But I just need my church to pray for us. Can you do that? Here's the rules. Don't go bother my wife about what's going on. Don't bother my son. I don't want to talk about it. There are some things that are so painful that you're brought to a place where you say, please just pray for me. And can I tell you, church, that that's okay. If you need to come up here and you need prayer and don't want to tell me about it, God knows. And if you need somebody else to pray for you in the church and you don't want to tell them about it, God knows. It's okay. And when the level of pain is that deep, it's okay. It's okay. But that's called a trial. And that's what we're going to talk about today when we look at a man named Abraham in the book of Romans here. Okay, when we look at these heroes in the Bible, we tend to look at them as if they're superhuman and better than us. And they're so blessed because they're better than me is the way that I look at it. But that's not true. And we're going to see that really what made Abraham an example for us wasn't that he was so fantastic. It's what he did through the trials. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Watch this. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. This just validated what I said. When it references the law, it's not saying that Abraham was better than you or me. When the Bible references the law and says Abraham isn't an example to us because of how well he followed the law, and by the way, the law, to make it easy, goes something like this. It's all that God tells us to do and all that God tells us not to do. And obedience is how well we do what God tells us to do and how well we don't do what God tells us not to do. So we can't look at Abraham and go, well, he must have been really good and he must have been right. Nope, that's not what the Bible says. It literally says it was the righteousness of faith 
that made him significant. We say that we're Christians, but if we're being honest, what in the world is faith? What does that even mean? What does it look like? It's a word that's all but lost to people who weren't raised in the church. And maybe we've been walking with Jesus for a long time that we're convinced that we understand what faith is, when maybe we really don't. So let's learn. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Why? Because the law brings la wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you, Abraham, the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Here's what we just learned from the Bible. There is nothing that you and I can do in our power to save ourselves from sin. There is no work that you and I can accomplish that is so good that we can work our way to heaven. There is nothing that you and I can do to ever be righteous by the standard of God's law on our own. In of ourselves, there is absolutely nothing that we can do to earn a relationship with God, to be worthy of a relationship with God. And let me tell you why that's a good thing. See, the book of Romans, it's almost bipolar. I struggle with it. For weeks, I'm preaching sermons where it looks like the Bible says, follow the law or you're going to hell. Over and over and over again. And I'm praying, I'm like, okay, God, let people show up next week. Like, this is really heavy stuff. And now, same book, same author, he's like, yeah, the law's okay, but look over here. Let's not focus on that anymore. What he actually said was, God's law is beneficial because it shows us that we are under God's wrath. What? Why is that good news? We're going to work our way to a word called grace. One of my greatest struggles as a pastor is the recognition of my insufficiency before God. One of my greatest struggles is that I know myself, I know my life, and I can count the number of ways that I'm not right, that I'm not good, that I need help, that I can't do it on my own. I hate asking for help. I hate demonstrating weakness. And the Bible just said, no, no, the reason why God's law is good isn't because you're actually going to be perfect in following it and obeying it. The reason why God's law is good is because it shows you your insufficiency. And it actually shows you the consequences of your insufficiency. But it also shows you the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what grace is like. This amazing word called grace. Grace is something that's given to us when we don't deserve it. Literally imagine this scenario. You've worked hard your whole life. Imagine that you've been successful and you actually have something to leave behind in an inheritance. Now, maybe as we're already talking, you're thinking about people who you would leave your wealth to, your life's work to. This is what grace looks like. You know what? I'm going to choose the most unworthy person. I'm going to choose my greatest enemy. And I'm going to give them grace and my inheritance. What? 
That is what the Bible says you and I are under. And that's good news for everybody who feels insufficient today. What we need to do is we need to move from this self-deprecation of insufficiency and take on this word called humility because God doesn't want us to live in this constant beating down of ourselves. What he wants is for us to not look down on ourselves but to look up to Jesus Christ and to look at ourselves and go, you know what? I know who I am. I know who I'm not. And because I recognize who I am, I know my deep need of the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it for us even more. This shows God's love more than anything we could ever understand. When you truly love somebody, now come to me, don't mess around with me today. You've got to know this, especially if you're dating somebody, here's the test. Here's what love looks like. If you love somebody, there is literally nothing that person can do that would cause you to turn your back on them. Now, don't be weird. Lots of Christians are weird. We're not talking about staying in abusive relationships. We're not talking about there not being a time to put up boundaries because there are. But if you love somebody, the test is, is there anything you could do to turn your back on them? What the Bible just taught us is God has perfect standards and there are consequences for sinning against his standards, which we all have, to varying degrees. Doesn't matter though. If you're not perfect, you haven't fulfilled God's law. And it's God's love that looks at us and goes, I love you so much that I forgive you. All you have to do is receive it. That's what grace is. And that's where our faith comes from. So for those of you who struggle like me from time to time, and you look at life and you go, you know what? I'm not good enough. I even hear from people from time to time, I didn't make it to church on Sunday because I was feeling pretty low. It's like, well, that's when you need to go the most because you need the love of Jesus Christ. Nobody's going to beat you up here. Did you know that? Jesus never puts us down when we're already down. He doesn't excuse our sin, but he relieves us. Do you know how important that word relief is? Some of you look like you're wound up so tight that you might have a panic attack right now. It's like, you need to unscrew the wind-up on that toy, man. How do you do that? You need the relief of Jesus. And where do you find that? In your faith. Watch. It says, Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Now watch this. This is the real word of God right here. There's all kinds of churches out there. I know you've been to them. Jesus loves you. This we know for the Bible tells you so. You're all fearfully and wonderfully made. You are awesome. Yeah, that's all true, but then it also says things like this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. Isn't that awesome? Abraham was so old that he was as good as dead. Want the validation? Read it. Since he was about 100 years old. I really like it when I get hate mail from the internet. And I'm like... Who's this old man named Jimbo that you harass in the church? You need to be nice to old people. I'm like, I'm just as nice as the Bible is, man. You need to check your faith. I really respect everybody who's lived a long time because I imagine that you've been through a lot of suffering. Can we give a round of applause for all of our old people? <laughs> By the way, all right, midlife is not 50. If you're 37 like me, you're halfway there, you are old. But what's the Bible talking about? He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, 
or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Here's what the Bible's talking about. See, Abram, his original name, God has a strange way of changing people's names. Can't really figure that out, to be honest with you. It's like, I'm going to give you a secret. You're fortunate to be tuning in today. Here's my full name. You ready? I hate it. Shane Kyle Hicks. Sign me up for the honky tonk. It's like I look at my son Jesse and I'm like, you have no idea how cool your name is. Shane Kyle, come on, Jesus. Give me a new name, please. And Hicks, do you know how many jokes I've gotten? But here's the thing about Abram's name. Here's the cruelty. His name went something like, hi, Dad. That's the translation. And he went a hundred years without kids. Now, some of you dinks out there, double income, no kids, you're like, praise God. Not in that culture. In that culture, if you didn't have kids, you had nothing. Because it was all about your line, your lineage, what you were leaving behind, how you were going to preserve your name. That was it. And Abraham, he never had kids until he was 100 years old. Now, think about that one. I'm 37. I've got a baby girl coming in about four weeks or sooner. Praise God. I'm 37. We've already established that I am. No, I'm not young. Oh, that's right. It's like, man, God, this would have been a lot easier when I was like, I don't know, 18. It's like, didn't know anything, but at least I had some more energy. But look, I'm sure Abraham thought the same thing. But did you catch that his faith was tied to the challenges of his age and it was tied to the challenges of not having kids and it was tied to the challenge that his wife struggled with infertility. Have any of you been touched by infertility? Either your immediate family or somebody that you love? Yeah. You just can't know the pain of infertility and that's in our culture and it would have been, not to diminish our pain, but it would have been that much more in Abraham's time. I remember when we started trying to have kids and it wasn't working. We started looking into what was wrong and we found out that it was going to be a journey and we were going through treatments and it didn't work. And we were praying and it didn't seem like anything was happening. And then literally, I remember the pain of a moment when I was speaking at a summer camp for youth kids. And Whitney had just gone to an infertility doctor. And I was expecting good news. And she called me as I was getting ready to speak. And it felt like I got punched in the chest. And she was crying. And she said, the doctor asked when we're going to stop torturing ourselves because it's not going to happen. That's a trial. God, where are you? Why? And forgive me for being a human, but there's a lot of people who shouldn't have kids. I look around and it's like some of the people that I grew up with turned out to be abusive. And they look at a man and get pregnant. If you're confused, learn a little more. But that's like how easy it was. And I go, God, why? Why? In that trial, Jesus taught me something about faith. Faith looks something like this. And this is by the grace of Jesus. Because I didn't want to go out and speak. I didn't want to do it. I threw away my sermon and I went out on that stage and I shared exactly what was going on. This is our trial. We've been on an infertility journey. 
it looks like we're out of that trial. And it's the end. And we've been told we're never going to have kids. And I stood in front of hundreds of people and I said, but I will tell you this with certainty. God is God. The Bible is his word and it's true. And even if I don't feel like it, or I have to borrow his strength and the strength of his people to follow him, I will follow Jesus. I will follow Jesus. I will follow Jesus. And to merge stories together, I think that the reason why I was prepared for that moment was because when I got back off of that plane from Maui and I left the promised land for the gates of hell, I had a mental health battle. And I had panic attacks that were so severe that even when I wanted to go to college, I couldn't make it a lot of the days. And then I had a spiritual battle because pastors and Christians looked at me and said, mental health, you must have a demon or something. I don't know where you're at on your journey today. But I just want to tell you, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay. You do not have to pretend. You don't have to lie. You can be at the lowest point of your life in this church. And we will love you. And if somebody in here kicks you while you're down, let me know and I'll kick them in the face. No round of applause? You said... I think I pulled something, man. 37. Woo. I can't move like that. I'm going to feel that. <laughs> That's what faith looks like. And the Bible says that when Abraham was confronted with all these challenges, he didn't weaken in faith. It's like, you know what? You can feel weak without weakening in faith. And if you're filled with doubts and all kinds of questions and you're struggling, you're in a trial and that's okay. You haven't lost your salvation. You're not going to hell. It's okay to say, God, where are you and why am I here? What is happening right now? I need some help and I need some answers and you're not talking to me right now. That's okay. Want to know how I know? It literally says Jesus' disciples saw Jesus Christ resurrect from the dead. And they still doubted. Like, well, I saw this, but I don't know if that's actually God. So we who can't see, have some grace on yourself. You know, the Bible says that the greatest commandments are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. There was such a ridiculous movement in churches for like at least two decades that I'm aware of where it was like, don't love yourself. That's called pride. You need to be humble and think low of yourself and know that you're trash. No. Absolutely not. You go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, and you start applying the principles of love to yourself. Because as a dad... I look at my kid and my daughter-to-be and I go, if you can't think highly of yourself or you go through depression or things like I have, then you listen to daddy's words because these are God's word for you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of the almighty God. And he loves you so much that he was willing to die for you. And some of you just need to hear that today. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. It matters who Jesus is, what he's done, and where he is taking you. And sometimes you might not feel like that, 
But that's faith. God is God. I believe the Bible is his word. And I'm following Jesus. That's what Abraham did. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness because it didn't weaken. He didn't give up. He didn't leave. But the words it was counted to him were not written only for his sake alone. Then for whose? But for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who was raised from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. If you believe that Jesus Christ is God, if you believe that he resurrected from the dead, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, even when you don't feel like it, and even in your own belief when you have to look for God and say, God, I believe, but please help me believe. Help me, God. I'm slipping. I'm falling. It's too much. I can't do it, Lord. I need you to carry me. I'm scared. I'm slipping. If that's you, Jesus has you. And he will not let you go even if you feel like you have let him go. If you can force your will and your mind to say, Jesus is God. He saved me. If you can bring yourself there, it doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter. The Bible says that the heart is deceptive above all else. Sometimes you need to look at your heart and you need to tell it, shut up. I'm going to trust the word of God over what I feel. That's what Abraham did. And by the way, that's what Jesus Christ did for us too on his way to the cross. He didn't really feel much like going The Bible actually says that he said, Father, if there is any other way, let's do that. I don't want to do this. And in your walk with Jesus, if you've ever said, I don't want this, God. I don't want to do this. This isn't what I asked for. This is too hard. It's like when you think of trials, nobody goes, I'm going to get married to have marriage problems. I'm going to have kids and have to carry all the burdens of their life on myself. I'm going to go get a job, agree to get a job that I don't like. Nobody says any of these things. I'm going to take care of my health and do everything right only for it to fail. There's a lot of reasons that we can be justified in feeling Whatever we feel. But that's where our faith is tested. So look, here's the truth the rewards God has for us are earned through the grief in sacrifice. That's where you find rewards, church. I wish. It's like, look, I wish. And I could stand up here and tell you, follow Jesus. Everything's always going to be okay. You're always going to feel good. You're going to be healthy. You're going to be wealthy. You're not going to have any problems. I can't say that of this life. But if you get through this life, I promise you that heaven is coming. Can we say that? Heaven is coming. Whatever we're going through right now, Heaven is coming. But I got to get through what I'm going through right now to get to where God has already gone. So look at Abraham's sacrifice and see if maybe any of them resonate with you. Make no mistake, Abraham was blessed to a tremendous degree. And in following Jesus, all of us are blessed in different degrees. But look what Abraham had to do. He left his home. That's how his journey with God started. You've got to go. And some of you are like, I'm trying to get out of California. Absolutely not. God's not calling you to that. Jesus shut it down. No. Christians need to stop leaving California. Knock it off. But here's why this is a big deal for Abraham. Thousands of years ago, was there a thing called a cell phone? 
Nope. Was there the internet? Nope. Some of you remember a time long ago where if you tried to get a hold of somebody, it was completely possible to not be able to. There was a time when we survived wall phones and we had to fight over who got to call somebody. There was a time when the internet and the phone line were shared. And if you were trying to play a video game online and your mom picked up the phone, World War III commenced in the house. There were dark days, but my friends, they were darker. In Abraham's day, if you left home, that was goodbye. I'm never going to see you again. He had to do that. And think about this. He left home and it's not like, well, okay, I'm leaving here. I'll just go have some more kids. He couldn't. His wife was infertile. We touched that. He became a parent at 100. We joked about that. It was a blessing, but there's no way it was easy. The Bible said his body was as good as dead. You look at that and go, maybe you should have picked somebody younger. God might have been a little bit more of a blessing to them. The Lord's ways are not our ways. But here's the one I hate. God's trial to sacrifice his son, Isaac. I'm glad to see that not all of you know this story. When we read the Bible, there's times where we're going to see something. We'll go, I thought that God was a God of love. Who is this? What is this about? Look at this. God said to Abraham, Take your son, your only son, Isaac. Your only son, who was a miracle that I gave to you, and who I told you was going to be your blessing to bring forth the people of God. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, isn't this just, can you feel the grind on Abraham's soul? Can you feel how the air must have been sucked out of his body? Can you feel the tension in God speaking to him and giving him a command and Abraham saying, I don't know if I can do that. Because make no mistake, I believe that this is one of the greatest trials in history. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So for those of you who don't know the story, it's really graphic and you might not come to church ever again. So he did it. No, I'm totally messing with you. <laughs> Here's what happened. Because Abraham had faith in God. Abraham was obedient. And he took his son Isaac to be sacrificed just like God had commanded. And imagine this story. And if you are a good parent, there is no hell on this earth greater than your kid's suffering. And Abraham's going up the mountain and Isaac was familiar with offerings and sacrifices. And Isaac looks at Abraham and he says, Daddy, where's the sacrifice? And this is what Abraham said. God will provide. Abraham's faith was so great. I'm sure that he believed that even if he sacrificed Isaac, that God was going to resurrect him from the dead. Or he was going to do an unspeakable miracle. That's how great Abraham's faith was. So what happened was, Abraham tied Isaac up on the offering table. 
and right when he was going to sacrifice his son, God said, Stop! Get that boy off that table. You've passed the trial. And Abraham looked, and there was a ram caught in the thicket. And just like Abraham said, God provided the sacrifice. Here's a question I want to ask you. What could God ask you to sacrifice that would challenge your faith? Whatever it might be. Because look at this in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take up your torture device and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Here's a truth about life is that Jesus asks us to place our entire lives on the altar of sacrifice. And all the things that God allows us to keep are blessings. They're blessings. As we end today, I want you to see a parallel. God told Abraham, go and sacrifice your son Isaac, and then he stopped him from doing it. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he made that sacrifice for you and me. God the Father loves Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with more love than you and I can ever imagine. And he made that sacrifice for you and me. So my question for all of us is, what is it that we don't want to sacrifice in order to follow God? What are we holding on to too tightly? Or if something is being ripped from you right now and life is falling apart around you and you're scared, you're suffering or somebody you love is suffering, maybe there's nothing that you can do, whatever it might be. Are you able just to bring yourself to a place that says, I believe in that great love of Jesus Christ. I believe in that great love of God the Father who sacrificed his only son. I believe in the kind of grace that receives me when I'm unreceivable. I believe. Let's all stand together. Father God, we come before you, Lord. I wish that we could see your face now. I wish so much that we could receive the embrace of Jesus. God, I wish that you were physically among us so that those who need healing could run and grab the edge of your robe and be healed. Lord, I wish that I had the gift of healing and could heal everybody in this room. Lord, I wish that we never had to go through any trial or tribulation or pain or sorrow or grief. God, I wish that we could experience heaven on earth. Lord, these are all the things that we wish. But Lord, what your promise to us is, is that if we have faith, we can hope for all of these things in the life to come and we can taste them now, God. So Lord, for every single person in this room who needs healing, God, I pray. I beg, Lord, I come before you. I ask you to heal them, Jesus. Heal them, God. Jesus, we believe. We believe, God. Heal cancer. Heal autoimmune conditions. Heal mental disorders. Heal whatever is painful, God. Please bring healing. Lord, we ask you to fix relationships that are broken. We ask you to fix us, God. Help us to overcome sin. 
Help us to overcome the things that separate us from you. Help us to overcome the things that we can't overcome by ourselves, God. Lord, for those who are on the edge and they have questions and they're wondering where you are and they don't know if their faith can hold, God, would you help them to cry out to you? Would you allow them to reach out to you, God? Would you miraculously speak to them? Would you give them a new hope, a new encouragement, a new awareness of your love? God, would you show us that you're fighting for us, Lord? It's not that we believe in you because of signs and wonders, but sometimes we just need to see the miracle of God. So, Lord, I pray for miracles here, God. I pray for miracles. We pray for miracles, Lord. Even if the miracle is only enough strength to get through the day, God, is only enough strength to muster one more step, Jesus. And God, for those who are here who don't believe in you yet, Lord, would you break their hearts? Would you show them that they need you? Would you show them that you're real? Would you allow them to lay down their pride and to say, I believe, God. I believe, Lord. I believe. And God, for those who are just ready to tack out, would you allow us to say, I surrender. And God, in that surrender with every person in the room, God, I pray that you would come on them like a mighty rushing wind, like a tsunami out in the middle of the ocean. Lord, I pray that you would come on us, the Spirit of God, in a way that is recognizable in how we are able to do that which is impossible for us and can only come through the power of God. I pray that a new wave of worshipers arises. I pray that a new wave of servers step up, God. I pray that we demonstrate the power of the love of Jesus Christ to one another and the world around us, even if we can't feel it ourselves, Lord. Jesus, we pray for our teenagers. We pray for our children. God, I ask that you would hold them in ways that we never can. Lord, I ask that you protect them when we're not with them. God, I ask that you would love them in ways that are so much deeper than our own love. God, I ask that you would make them strong, Lord. God, so strong. And Jesus, I pray that you would save them. Jesus, I pray that whatever it takes, that you would save our teenagers and children. And Lord, for the parents whose hearts are breaking, the grandparents whose hearts are breaking. Lord, would you hold those pieces together? And Jesus, would you allow us to have the boldness even sometimes just to say, would you please pray for me? I can't even say why, but would you just please pray for me? I need Jesus. I need God. I'm going through something. I just can't even speak it because it's so painful. Because Lord, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of, God. And that's the kind of church that is honoring to you. So Jesus, we love you. We trust you. And in faith, we say, I believe.